Hello and welcome to a new video about measure theory. And as always, I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady. And today's topic is the very important Fubini's theorem. This is probably one of the most used facts when dealing with integrals or when you want to calculate integrals. Indeed, it's a generalization of Cavalieri's principle, which we discussed in other videos. Hence, please recall what we considered there. We had two measure spaces, x1 and x2. And then we formed a new measure space on the Cartesian product. And the measure mu here is called our product measure. Now, if you look at the picture again, you also recall that the product measure fulfills the following rule. And please also recall that there is exactly one measure with this rule if the two measures mu1 and mu2 are sigma finite. By knowing this, we can immediately formulate Fubini's theorem. Let's start with the assumptions. As promised, our measures should be sigma finite and the product measure is just denoted by mu. And now we also consider a function f that lives on this Cartesian product. As always, we start by considering non-negative functions, where we also allow the symbol infinity. Naturally, this map should be measurable with respect to this sigma algebra here and the Boel sigma algebra here on the right. Then we can look at the integral of this function and find the following. Namely, we can calculate the integral with respect to the Cartesian product here in an iterative way. This means that we first calculate an integral with respect to the measure mu1. Hence we have an integral with x1 and here we have the function f but now we need variables so I choose a lowercase x and a lowercase y. So this is an integral with respect to mu1 and the first variable lowercase x. In other words, this is an integral here on the green space. And in the next step, we sum up all possible integrals of this form in the red direction. Which now means that we have the integral with respect to x2 of all these integrals and also with respect to our measure mu2 and with respect to lowercase y. In addition, Fubini tells us that also the other order gives the same result. Which means that first in the inner part we integrate with respect to x2 and then we integrate with respect to x1 and mu1. And that's Fubini's theorem. Essentially it tells us that calculating an integral with respect to the product measure is not harder than calculating the integrals with respect to the original measures. So now maybe you're also interested in calculating integrals of functions besides the non-negative ones. And in fact, Fubini's theorem also holds for such functions that are integrable with respect to the product measure. This means that the symbol here is well defined and has a finite value. Or in other words, our f lies in curved L1 of our product measure. In this case, one has to define these integrals here in the right way, but then basically the whole thing looks the same and it works the same. Naturally, I now want to give you an application and an easy example for Fubini's theorem. Here I want mu to be the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure which means it's the product measure of two one-dimensional Lebesgue measures. Now what we want to calculate is a two-dimensional integral for a set A and a function f. Here A should be a subset of R2 and in fact I want it to be a subset of the unit square. And in addition I want the property that y is always between x and x squared. Indeed there I can give you a nice picture in two dimensions. Here we have the line x and there we have the parabola x squared. We want all the points in between, so this is our set A. 
And for the function f, I choose an easy function, which should be just 2 times x times y. And now we are ready to start the calculation. The integral here we are interested in, we can rewrite as an integral over r2 when we put in the characteristic function of a inside of the integral. So this is just the characteristic or the indicator function. What we get now is a non-negative function, nr2 here, so we can just apply Frobenius theorem. It tells us that we can write this as two one-dimensional integrals. And there you see immediately the advantage, because how to calculate one-dimensional integrals, you already know. The only question that remains here is, what is the best order we can choose for Frobenius theorem? And we will see soon that it's better to first integrate with respect to y. And because we don't have any other measures than the Lebesgue measures, I can just write dy, there's no confusion in here. And then we integrate over x. And the only function that remains inside is just 2xy, and then we integrate with respect to y, and then the outer part with respect to x. Now if you look at a, you see that we can choose x, and then we have a correspondence for y. However, this simply means that we can choose x as we want, which means between 0 and 1. So we have the interval 0, 1 here, but we can write that as 0, 1 on the integral. Now for y, we know it has to lie between x squared and x, so it lies in the interval x squared x. So we can write here x squared and there x. And here you see why it was useful to choose this order here, because the correspondence for y was already here. For given x, we already knew what values y could have. For the other way around, we first had to calculate. Therefore, we chose this order. Now for the calculation, what you always should do is pull out all the factors. So we have here the factor 2, but for the inner integral also the factor x. So what remains inside is just the integral for the function y dy. And here the x. And now we reach the goal because here is just a normal one dimension integral which we can solve by using an antiderivative. It's just one half y squared and then you can put in the limits. This is not so hard and then what remains is just the integral what we have to solve in the end, which is here, x cubed minus x to the power 5 dx. Of course, you solve it in the same way, choose an antiderivative and then put in the limits. So what you get out is 1 over 4 minus 1 over 6, or in other words, 1 over 12 remains. And that's all for this example, which showed you Fubini's theorem in action. However, please remember, Fubini tells us that both orders here are possible. Therefore, for all problems where you have to deal with integrals or where you have to calculate integrals, always look what the best order is. It can happen that you don't have any chance with the one order, but the other order is very simple. What you also see here is that you can apply Fubini's theorem as often as you want, so for example, you can calculate a four-dimensional integral as well. In this case, you get out four one-dimensional integrals. And of course, also there, it's important that you choose the right order from the beginning. Therefore, always think about that at the beginning. Well, I hope that you now know what Fubini's theorem is and that you also learned something today. Then, thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye.